Persian Det here, my friends. It's Phil from One Wall Studio here to talk today about something that's kind of been weighing on me for a little bit uh, in the field of audio production in particular. We have an elephant in the room. It's kind of a big problem. It's a problem that some people accept begrudgingly, some people accept wholeheartedly, some people love and will absolutely die for, and some people cannot stand. On principle. So, what is this problem? I'm just going to come right out and say it. It is DRM. Now, some of you may not know what DRM is in the first place, and funny enough, when you Google or Bing or DuckDuckGo audio DRM, the very first autocompleted suggestion is how to remove DRM from audio. Clearly, that's not what we're talking about here, although it does touch on the mentality of end users in regards to DRM, and especially public sentiment towards it. So, DRM is basically a system designed to prevent the end user from using something that they haven't paid for. It stands for digital rights management, and this can take many, many forms. So, for example, if you can't read a certain book, or you can't read book formats in particular on a device of yours, uh, like a Kindle, for example. So, if you buy a book on the Kindle store, you may not be able to use that on anything other than a Kindle. Now, this is usually widely accepted as being an okay thing to do. Like, they invented the format they decide what the device uses because they invented the device. They invented the store. So, you know, it can go down a huge rabbit hole of why and when. This particular form of DRM is called platform exclusivity. So the idea is that other people can't use your content on a platform that isn't yours. It's an extremely basic form of DRM, and it's a great starting point in order to understand what DRM is all about. Because if you don't understand the idea of exclusivity, then it's going to be hard to understand or rationalize or even justify specifically what DRM is used for. Now, the idea is that a company will use DRM as a form of protection for their intellectual property or their copyright or whatever they're trying to publish or keep hidden from the outside world. You know, maybe they don't want people to know that something exists, so they'll use a form of internal DRM to prevent people from being able to share it outside the company and so on and so forth. There's a lot of different ways that DRM can exist, a lot of different ways it can look, but for all intents and purposes, DRM in an audio production sense is all about platform exclusivity. So one huge example is Avid. In the world of audio production, Avid is a company that utilizes platform exclusivity to a degree that I think is probably higher than most. So they actually invented a couple of plugin formats themselves, and their uh, plugins are the AAX plugin format, which is current, it's the current plugin format used by Pro Tools, and the RTAS plugin format, which, if I remember correctly, worked for Pro Tools 10, but not Pro Tools 11. So after Pro Tools 11, you can no longer use their own proprietary format of the RTAS or Real Time Audio Suite plugin format, which is kind of funny because it, it kind of gets a little bit at the heart of what this whole thing is about. So people who make those kinds of plugins, the plugins that are exclusive to the Pro Tools format, have to use the AAX format, and vice versa. If you make something for the AAX format, it'll only work on Pro Tools. So the only people who can use a plugin designed for the AAX format are people who own Pro Tools. Let me put this in perspective real quick. If a plugin is AAX only, the only potential market for that plugin is Pro Tools users. They can't use those plugins on another DAW, DAW, which means Digital Audio Workstation, for those of you who are kind of new to this ecosystem. They can't use those plugins on any other workstation. Likewise, if something's a Windows plugin only, you can't use it on Mac OS, or at least not very easily. And it's usually, actually in my experience, even more easy to use a Windows plugin on a Linux machine, but I digress. Every platform has some kind of exclusivity. Some are very obvious, and the pros and cons for both are kind of easy to understand. And that's why I wanted to start with this kind of DRM. So, no one can use your plugin on a platform you don't authorize to use them on. This allows for tight control to varying degrees depending on how much effort's put into the infrastructure of the format and how much the potential customer base is willing to accept. So there's two different kinds of exclusivity. 
One is soft exclusivity and the other is hard exclusivity. Basically, the difference between the two is that soft exclusivity isn't designed to exclude necessarily, but because of the format the product is designed for, it's harder to use on a different platform simply due to structure. However, this isn't always intentional. So for example, some companies support plugins that are being run on, let's say, Linux, or have unofficial community support for people who want to use Windows-only plugins on Linux. So this is obviously a vastly more inclusive approach than ensuring that a format cannot be used on another system, which would be hard exclusivity. So Avid does not want to support the AAX plugin format on any platform, let alone allow AAX to be used in another DAW. That would create, well, a more free and open market and take away one of the main selling points of Pro Tools. But so it stands, Pro Tools has some exclusive plugins. As a result, people are more likely to spend money on it for the sake of getting those plugins if they do the job that the person needs. The alternative to soft or hard exclusivity is an open SDK. So for those of you who don't know, an SDK is a software development kit. A company will release it to allow people to design for a format, thereby propagating the use of that format and allow people to work within the confines of the limitations of that format. It'll help them understand how it works and it'll help them to be able to compile their plugins for that format. So if you download, for example, Steinberg's Open SDK for the VST format, you'd then be able to compile any of your plugins into VST format. If a company allows anyone to design using a format, and that format can be integrated into any platform or any DAW, then that would allow for an extremely open ecosystem. And therefore, you'd be reaching the most possible customers. The most possible users would be able to use and purchase that product. Whereas if I don't own Pro Tools, I cannot buy something exclusive to Pro Tools. I know that that sounds really obvious. I know that that sounds almost redundant, but it is just super important to understand the basics for where we're about to head. Air Windows and Audio Assault are really good co examples of companies in the plugin market who make plugins that work for virtually any system. They both utilize the uh, VST format. They both have audio units for Apple. They have uh, Linux-based VSTs as well. So you can download a zip folder with a Linux, Mac, and a Windows installer, as well as uh, standalone binaries basically meaning you can use them on any system. So if you were to go to Air Windows or Audio Assault right now and buy a plugin or download a plugin, you'd be able to use it anywhere for any purpose at any time and you just have to install it, right? Real easy, real open. Now, since Steinberg created and developed the VST plugin format and opened up the SDK that anyone can design for it, they created a nearly universal plugin format. That's why VSTs are so common, and they include the VST instrument format for anybody who's interested in virtual instruments, which is why there are so many virtual instruments in the VSTi format. So another example of an open plugin format would be LV2, which stands for LADSPA version 2. I just think LV2 is a way easier name personally. But it was an example of a soft exclusionary format because you could only use it on Linux operating system. But because it's so open and extensible, it was ported and implemented into Windows-based systems so you can use it with Ardor or Harrison Mixbus or Audacity. And even Reaper is implementing LV2. And that's an amazing thing. So even if your system is somewhat soft exclusionary, if it's open enough it can become less exclusionary over time because it's really only limited to the people who develop for it. Now, the more options the end user has, in my opinion, the better, because I'm all for consumer protections and the advocacy of consumers' rights on the grounds that they deserve to have something that they can pay for, that will just work, and will work to meet their needs. What then can be said about AAX? 
Well, it's a hard exclusionary format. You can use it exclusively on Windows or Mac operating systems and in a single DAW, a single DAW owned by Avid called Pro Tools. And if you don't have Pro Tools, you really can't use AAX. And even on Linux, if you want to use AAX, you exclusively have to use Pro Tools. You have to find a way to emulate Windows or run a virtual machine or do some magic with wine or something to make it run in Pro Tools exclusively. You really can't get around that. Same with the audio unit format on Mac operating systems. While audio units are a lot more open and you can design for them, they are heavily restricted to the Macintosh operating system because they are a core part of how audio works on a Mac. So, what? <laughs> you may be asking, why does any of this matter? Well, it's the first of many, many layers of restriction that could affect your ability to use the plugins and softwares that you want to. That's the first thing that could get in your way. Maybe you have a Mac and you can't use any of the plugins that you want, so you have to find a way to get them to work with your system. Let's say that you don't like being restricted to audio units or VSTs. Or you really like VSTs, but only so many of them are compiled for the Mac. Even though VST is an open format, it's up to the developer to decide which platform they allow. So they may have chosen an open format, but they didn't allow for your platform. Maybe you use Wine or Wine Tricks to get it working with your system, and it works pretty well. Those are both... Uh, not emulation layers, but they kind of are emulation layers that work to run plugins from other platforms and programs from other platforms on your system. So the developer made the decision due to their experiences, their financial situation, or even just because they wanted to, to make their plugin for a single platform. That's entirely their prerogative but it's just the beginning. Let's say that developer, hypothetically, then decides that they really want to make sure that this exclusivity sticks. So they design a call and response system. Basically, as a form of DRM, the developer has a system in place to generate a license key based on any number of things. It could be your account ID with their company on their website. It could be your machine ID. It could be anything. Then, before you can use the plugin, you have to either have that license key saved on your machine and import it into the plugin, like Valhalla does, or copy and paste a code, like with Boz Digital. So, by extension, this can create a harder exclusivity, depending on how the license key works. There are a lot of gray areas with DRM, and then there's a lot of different methods of pros and cons being balanced so that the company can decide, you know, this is in my best interest and the customer's best interest, or this will work really well for me and it won't step in the way of the customer too much. So with Valhalla or Kuasa or any of those kinds of companies, you can use a license key that just always works. You've got it, it stays licensed, and it works no matter what system you're using it on. So this is like the easiest type of licensing setup because you do it once, then you migrate to a new system, a whole new computer, a whole new operating system. It should theoretically still work. You won't have to reauthorize, and if you do, you've got the file right there. You just navigate to it on your hard drive. I personally, for the plugins that I have like that, I keep them in a license folder, and that helps immensely with keeping track of all of the things that I have licensed and never having to worry about it. Because I know if I start it up and it's not licensed, I'll just point it to the license folder, and it'll find its license key, no problem. However, sometimes with systems like... And I don't want to call them out for it because I love their products. But like Boz Digital, the licensing doesn't always work on systems that it's not designed to support. And there's nothing wrong with that. But on the flip side, good luck authorizing the wall or manic compressor on a Linux system. Copy and paste as many times as you want on unsupported systems. It will be hit or miss. So this is pretty soft exclusionary DRM. Because on the one hand, it's designed to work on pretty much every system, and you could run it in a virtual machine or on Linux, but the DRM doesn't allow it to stick. You can usually only use it for one instance, but it wasn't intended that way. So if they came out with an update eventually that fixed that problem, even though it's not technically a supported system, it would function still, right? So for the time being, I'm going to call it soft exclusionary. 
But it doesn't have to be soft exclusionary with a more open licensing system like Valhalla's because you point to a folder and no matter what system you're on, it will authorize. I can use the same license on Mac, Windows, Linux, you name it. As long as I can point to the license, it works. The alternative here, of course, is something like the company Hornet or the company SK Note. Once you buy their plugins, you own them. You don't have to import a license key. You just own them. Install them, put them in whatever folder you want. They will always work for you. They're self-contained. You could back up your plugins folder, drop it on another system, and it'll still run. Why? Because the company believes that once you're a customer, SK Note, Hornet, you name it, you actually have a right to the software that you own. However you want it, wherever you want it, without any form of hand-wringing or nagging. The other alternative, though, to this form of DRM isn't actually an alternative, but a concept. It's a solid way of doing the same thing that Valhalla does. Basically, I'm talking about the Reaper method, which, if you haven't paid for a license and you, you know, have the doll Reaper... It'll nag you for about five seconds on loadup to remind you to import the license key. It doesn't assume that you're a criminal. In fact, it assumes the exact opposite. It assumes that you have a license and just haven't imported it. So, after five seconds, the nag screen goes away. If for some reason your computer needs to be relicensed, then the doll doesn't just stop working. It's an extremely permissive form of DRM. It reminds you to buy or import the key, but it never becomes non-functional. So you can always use it, even if something goes wrong with the DRM. And honestly, things do go wrong with DRM. But if you have a permissive licensing system like this, then you can use it even before you import the license, even before you copy and paste a key, even before you buy the product. <laughs> So not everybody can afford to do that. And I get that. Not everybody feels like that's a safe option. The guys over at Reaper are just amazing. I'll be honest. They, they just are. So I love Reaper and I love their model, but they understand what happens when things go wrong with DRM. And boy, do things ever go wrong with DRM? Aside from audio, right? So let's step out of our little microcosm for a second and look at the wider world of content. So there's video games, books, movies, songs, art, all of these things that no human will ever have the opportunity to experience again if they're locked behind a ticking time bomb of DRM. There are forms of art that are lost forever to time. There are literally forms of video games, for example, or early attempts at music that you put them on a floppy, put a form of DRM on them, and then once they, that floppy dies, because you couldn't copy from them, because they had no way of saving the music anywhere else due to that whole don't copy that floppy campaign, that DRM took that music, that game, that footage, that document to the grave. I mean, once DRM is on something, it becomes inevitably a ticking time bomb. You can't replicate that art anymore. Unless there's a master somewhere that somebody has access to, it's never going to see the light of day again because DRM has a shelf life. Once the company has made their money off the sale, with this kind of DRM, there's no incentive to keep a product alive. With some forms of DRM, if the authorization server connected to the internet dies, no one can use that plugin anymore or authorize it. Here's how we get into the harder forms of DRM, right? IK Multimedia, as much as I love their products, they use a product key and machine authorization method. And this is common of companies like Brainworks, who through Plugin Alliance, which I love, there's nothing wrong with the products that these companies make, and they do try to make it easy. They have what's called the central manager style of authorization, or that's what I call it at least. Basically, you install a program or you go to a website, you log in using your account, and instead of downloading and installing your programs yourself, you can have this management software or a, a built software download, install, authorize everything in like one or two clicks. In other words, it's a trade-off. It's for convenience. You get to install a single program or log into a single website, authorize all that company's plugins through it, and install them, hopefully in a quick, easy, and painless way. 
Then you get the plugins you own all at once. Usually just the plugins you own, right? And that's a method that tries to give you something worth the price of admission on top of making sure that you don't run plugins you don't own. You can't just install a plugin you don't have typically, or you can get a trial. And once that trial's up, like a two week or a three day trial, uh, it just stops working because of course the authorizations usually have a time-based mechanic to cause them to fail. And a free trial is a good example of that because usually with a free trial, you get unimpeded access to the plugin that after the trial ends is all behind a paywall and they either just stop working entirely or they implement some kind of 40 second noise or dropout system. And those are just frustrating. So the cons of this kind of system of course, are that you must continually update, update these things and install the latest, hopefully greatest version of the Software Center if you want to get new products. Some of them, like IK Multimedia, make it as streamlined as possible and even allow you to open standalone instances of the plugins or the stores to buy more stuff right from the comfort of a single application. This can be great for focus and ease of use. I mean, it'll tell you how many more computers you're allowed to install the software on with your particular license and what the latest version is. Brainworks doesn't really have that, nor does Plugin Alliance, but the authorization process is still the same. Their websites tell you how many activations you have or how many times you're allowed to use the plugin. But of course, every time you install it on a new computer, you have one less activation you can make. The downside, of course, is that you have a finite number of chances. If you have a spate of bad luck or a storm destroys your laptop and your desktop and your tablet all in one go, you'll have to figure out which one gets replaced and which one gets to keep that fancy license for the 70s style EQ that you really like. You can't install it on more computers than that. Not to sound like I'm in the bag for IK Multimedia, but... They get around this somewhat by just giving you a lot of license activations. Same with Audio Assault, actually. Their system's ridiculously easy. You load the plugin, put in your email address that you bought the plugin from at the activation screen, you click the button, you're authorized. You run out of downloads, you just contact support, ask for an updated download link, and boom, 10 more downloads. You're golden. You can usually tell you know, which companies care most about their end users based on how easy they make it to recover from catastrophes. And speaking of catastrophes, <laughs> about now is when I plan to talk about the iLock and e-licenser and dongles like them. So the idea behind these forms of DRM is that you take up a USB port on your computer for the express purpose of running licenses off of, or rather, to authorize licenses from. You see, for these kinds of DRM, the end user is forced to install a software. For Steinberg, that software also acts as the licensing and installation center, for like uh, IK Multimedia's products, for example. But they still do require a dongle of some kind, and hopefully they're moving away from that, but for the time being, I'm pretty sure you still need an e-licenser, which means either a specialty USB drive or any kind of USB drive that you keep plugged into your system. For Pace's iLock license manager, though, it's exclusively for seeing what licenses you own. It doesn't have links to download or install the programs or plugins. It shows you your account name, your hardware, a fancy cloud feature, and a list of USB port hogging dongles that lets you run programs you already paid for. The upside to this, of course, is that if you have these plugins installed on another system already, you can just plug in your iLock or e-licenser into that system and then run the plugins or software. Basically, any system can act as a dumb terminal for your products, and the licenser has the real keys that enables those systems to function. That's one of the plus sides. The other plus side, I guess, is that you could maybe lock people out of your system if you don't want them using your doll. Uh, in the case of Steinberg or Avid, which, you know, Cubase and Pro Tools being the big two things I'm thinking of, your specifically licensed dialogue plugins, uh, anything you don't want people to use, you could probably just pull out your licensor when you walk away from your system if you don't feel like having your computer locked, I guess. Having a password on your computer would definitely be a good way to prevent that from happening at all, but let's say that there's a very real scenario where you just need to leave your computer unlocked and don't want to let people use your Eventide Harmonizer plugin. Well, just pull that USB licensor out after safely ejecting it, and you're good to go. Unfortunately, therein lie the cons of that kind of system. 
let's say your computer doesn't read that USB port anymore. Whoops. You can't use those plugins. Maybe even your DAW. So you switch USB ports. Whoops. It's not the USB port. Turns out your dongle's broken. So what do you do? Well, lucky you. You hypothetical go-getter you. You shelled out $50 for another dongle as a backup so that you could easily make do in a situation like this to use the plugins you already paid for, that is. So you plug it in only to find out that the number of activations you can use for any of those plugins, almost all of your plugins, was a single activation. So you're down to half of your plugins left. Well, that's not true. You're down to half of the plugins that use this kind of DRM. So far, in this scenario, every other plugin you've ever purchased, installed, and have been running for years, maybe a decade or more, is still totally functional. The only ones that aren't loading are the ones that needed that extraneous USB drive that cost as much as your tracking headphones did. However, the pain doesn't stop there, because if you're so lucky as to have a doll that still loads without the licensor, it could probably just decide not to load at all because there are dozens of plugins in that session you're opening that require the licensing dongle. Hypothetical you, you have an entire session full of Neural DSP, Slate Digital, Oak Sound, Isotope, Sound Toys, Nembrini, Eventide, all of those plugins all over your mix and every single one of their plugins won't load. Except maybe that one Isotope plugin you authorized to your computer's machine ID before the iLock dongle ever came in. You know, through Isotope's licensing center. <laughs> Congratulations, sir. You can still use Trash 2 to your heart's content without your session taking 30 minutes to load before crashing. Yes, there's supposed to be fallbacks. There's supposed to be a nag screen that shows you what the plugin's looking for, like in the case of Slate Digital, at which point you're supposed to be able to just exit the screen and continue with the plugins bypassed. That's good design to solve a problem created by the DRM system that the company chose to utilize. All of this because a flash drive maybe died. Now let's say you want to get those licenses back so you can just, for the love of all that's holy, load that stupid plugin that you wanted to use in the first place. Well, did you pay for that special insurance policy that the company told you about? That yearly subscription fee for the dongle protection plan? Because you can't just be stealing licenses from those companies just because you have a sob story. No, you can't deactivate those license activations unless you plug the broken dongle in, prove that it works, and, you know, if it works, why do you have to deauthorize it at all? So you pay an additional yearly fee to get the licenses back when the dongle dies. All so that the company can charge you money to recover your property when their product fails, preventing you from doing your job. All so that you can keep using the other physical dongle in the same USB port with nothing to show for it but money missing from your bank account because they charge you so that you can keep paying them to take money from the companies whose plugins you love. But guess who isn't worrying about any of this? And here's the kicker, folks. Piracy. The reason DRM exists, supposedly, is to combat piracy. But the very people that this DRM is supposed to stop have ended up living lives free of fear using the very products that you purchase without ever losing access to them. Here's what I mean. In, a, in every pro audio forum and Facebook group I've ever been in, Whenever the iLock Cloud option goes down, that's their free option for those of you who are paying attention, it is the victim's fault that they can't open their stuff. They're told they should have spent $50 to use the products they already purchased. They shouldn't have expected a free solution to work. You know, like every other plugin that most of us already own that's free, paid for, licensed via key or license file, they shouldn't have expected a solution like that to work. No, 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 no. Buy a physical iLock because that's the only way it's going to work. Well, I don't know. Maybe I just find it pretty funny, given the fact that when it happens, and it happens, a lot of those people end up just using the free plugins because they're the only thing left that works on their system. Stock plugins, free plugins, plugins from companies that don't lock them out of their software just because. If my iLock died tomorrow, I'd still be able to do my job, but I'd be out thousands of dollars in software that makes my life easier when they work. They save me time. 
ironically, I'd have to go back to using free plugins that still work when all of my paid plugins shut me out because an iLock might go down. Because you can't expect paid plugins to work when they cost so much money and you spent so much money on not only the product itself, but the overhead cost that was factored into those plugins. Listen, this kind of DRM, it costs a lot of money to the companies who use it. Ironically, the pirates never go down. When confronted with tales of woe about iLock Cloud always dropping, having dropouts, you can't access your license for days, sometimes people have just outright not been able to connect to the cloud for a week or two at a time. Why would you need an always-on computer on the internet at all times to functionally record? It doesn't make sense, right? Well, of course not. So just buy it for 50 more bucks and then you're good. Maybe for a little while. <sighs> but here's the deal. There are people who will tell you always their opinion. I'm one of them. I'm doing it right now. But when confronted with the iLock Cloud scenario, there's three different responses that I've heard over and over again. And almost everybody falls into one of these categories. Category one is the people who say, you shouldn't have bought something that needs an eye lock. Okay, very helpful, but, uh, you know, they already did. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in this problem. Two, there's the people who say, you should have bought an eye lock because only a physical key works. Well, until it doesn't. And the third camp of people who say, oh, it went down. I wouldn't know. I use a crack. And those people are laughing. Maybe they paid for the product, but installed a crack after the fact because they have this crazy problem where they actually need their system to work. Or maybe they just pirated the whole thing and never worried about licensing at all. They're using those products as if they have the reliability of a Hornet or an SK Note or an Air Windows plugin, and they're getting the best experience out of anybody. Their plugins load faster because they circumvent the time-consuming licensing checks, and yes, logically, this must be true because it's executing less code and doing fewer checks every couple seconds for authorization. Therefore, lower CPU overhead, less chance of getting kicked out of your session because of some licensing error, I mean, I'm not advocating piracy at all, but piracy is a response to DRM. People who pirate say, you made an amazing product and I wish I could support your company, but I have to improve the execution before it's even remotely usable. And when the results are so much better with cracked software, it makes you wonder if any of these companies have ever even considered things like load times or legit users being able to use their products in emergency situations because pirates think about those things and they can use their stolen products. How fair is it that someone can steal what you purchased and have a better experience than you? How fair is it that someone can illegally download your company's product and make it load faster and run better because they got rid of the crippling middleware that plagues this industry? They prey on your fear and try to convince you that without them, your plugins will get pirated. Then, by the end of the week, the pirates have your plugins anyway, and they're showing all their friends how they made your product better. How is it fair that you're paying money and getting a lesser product because a company who sold it to you doesn't trust you to, what, use your product? Because that's all a consumer's doing. They're using the product. They're not selling it to someone else. They're not sharing it with others except to say, hey, look, this is amazing. Look at what this can do for me. They're using a tool to do their job. And if a company says, here's three layers of absolute suck to go through just to use this product, and don't be surprised if you still can't use it at the end. You might have to go through technical support and maybe, just maybe, your internet connection will drop out and you won't be able to use it at all. Then, of course, the response will always be there there has to be a better way. And there is. There are a ton of better ways. To put things in perspective, a lot of companies who were previously locked into the iLock ecosystem have been looking for another way. iLock costs too much to develop for. There were data breaches in 2019 and 2020, as well as license outages from the cloud constantly. Companies are quietly developing their own systems or walking away from iLock or phasing it out entirely, and it's just going to be a matter of time. If you have an iLock account like I do, especially one with hundreds of licenses attached to it, consider looking up whether or not your account name and password have been linked to online dumps. 
meaning your password and email address could have been leaked through iLock. Chances are, like me, yours probably has been. I know I was shocked when I saw it, but guess what? It happened. My password was leaked from iLock. So change your passwords, even if you don't see it online in a paste bin somewhere, just assume that you probably lost something. Support companies who treat their customers and other companies with some respect. iLock plays a dangerous game. Pace plays a dangerous game by convincing people that they're necessary for the company's survival. And then you have small companies who are starting up and they're being fed this fear mongering that, oh, as long as I get this Pace iLock thing going, I'll be able to keep my stuff from pirated software sites and people won't be stealing it. That's absolute garbage because at the end of the week their software will be all over those websites and they'll be none the wiser because they'll feel like they can sleep happy knowing that pace has their back for a nominal fee and for a chunk of their royalties these companies are losing money because they're fed a narrative of fear i'm not here to convince you that drm as a whole is evil but I can look to history and learn from it. And so can you. There are tons of pieces of software, games, books, movies, music, plugins that can never be accessed again. When you have a form of DRM that's so bad and so powerful that it prevents you from ever getting to use it once that form of DRM expires, you've already condemned your product to obsolescence. Look ahead of you. It may take a couple years, maybe a decade, maybe two decades, but when you buy something with a built-in expiration date, those days are numbered. Someday, every plugin you know that utilizes iLock-based DRM will go the way of the dodo. Those plugins that can no longer be authorized will fade into history, unusable and completely inaccessible because no one will be able to license them. They'll never be accessible again to anybody. You can't access things once the system in place is broken. Then, only the pirates who cracked them will have access to the tools that you paid for. Again, because when iLock's no longer a functional system, when all the companies leave it behind, the flagship products that worked so well for so many people will have met their end of life. That's not something that you see with a, a Yuri 1176 or an LA-2A from Teletronics. You can fix a broken compressor. You can replace an optical compressor. You can rebuild from scratch if you have to because those schematics are out there. That is a whole different world. There are studios still using pieces of tech from the 50s because it still works. But when iLock is broken, when all of these forms of DRM have met their grisly demise, those products that you worked so hard to save up for will be a memory. Hopefully by then, hopefully, we'll have created better products at less damaging forms of DRM. Hopefully by then, companies will trust their consumers and understand that the pirates are less likely to pirate something that treats them like consumers instead of criminals, like users instead of potential offenders. If your product is good, if it's priced well, and if it's designed to last, then people will buy it. If it's 30% more expensive than it should be and locked to a disgusting DRM scheme that people will avoid just because it sucks, then congratulations. The quality of your product will not save it. That DRM won't save your product, won't save your plugin from being pirated instead. It's easier than dealing with garbage DRM day in and day out. You have a right to your own creations and you have the right to your digital products. You have these rights as a creator, but don't be surprised if you end up sinking it before it has a chance to be appreciated because you alone have the right to kill your own creations by locking it in place and strapping it to a ticking time bomb that nobody wants to touch. <laughs>